I'd be like, oh my God, they're in my head. They they know, they know that was the song. And so they put that song on the radio and it's all, everything revolves around me. Because in the in the Truman show in the film, like the cameras are obviously all around and I'd be like, you know, looking around my room and I'd be like, well, that's that's a camera. Like my light bulb in my my ceiling light, that's a camera. And uh, and so, and, and on the Truman show, the film, everyone loved Jim Carrey's mm. character, right? Everyone loved him. And so I want that, I want that. Okay, so Johnny, obviously we've met before. If you want to give a brief introduction to yourself and who you are. Yeah, sure. So I'm Johnny and I am 35. I had to think about that. <laughs> and yeah, um, I've been working in mental health for uh, like just over a decade, basically because of my own lived experience of having mental health issues. Um, uh, but my, my, big, my big focus is, you know, getting to people when they're young. Because um, I just think if I'd have had to like, the right education and tools and support. Yeah, things could have been different for me. So yeah, that's sort of what I want to do now is help the next generation. Great, it's a great introduction. So now let's go back into your lived experience. Yeah. First of all, would you mind telling me what your diagnosis is? Yeah, sure. So um, when I was 20, I uh, got a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. And that's, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd never heard of that. But anyway, basically, it's a sort of combination of schizophrenia and, well, schizophrenia and bipolar. But for me, I think it was more, it is more schizophrenia and depression. I don't, I have, well, maybe a couple of times. I haven't really had the proper highs with bipolar that some people get. It's more the lows, like the real, real lows. So um, basically, it's, yeah, it's schizoaffective, it's, it's schizophrenia and a mood disorder together. Got you. And I think probably everybody watching or listening will have heard of schizophrenia. Yeah. Schizoaffective disorder is, I mean, I hadn't heard of it before I met you. Uh, is it a common diagnosis or is it slightly more rare in that kind of world? I think it's becoming more common, schizoaffective right. disorder, the diagnosis. With schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia affects one in a hundred people. Um, schizoaffective disorder is... Um, to, to be honest, I don't know the actual figures. I should do, shouldn't I? One in a hundred seems quite high to me. Do you think so? F yeah, for what I would consider sure. to seem like quite a serious condition. Is it because there's kind of a, a spectrum of how much it impacts on your life? Or do you think that once you've got diagnosed with that, it means it is having quite a serious impact? It's really interesting with like schizophrenia uh, or psychotic like illnesses. Like I think a lot of people think you just... You can't recover. You never recover. I thought that when I got my diagnosis, but um, it's like I think it's around sort of twenty five percent that actually have one episode and then recover, which is amazing. It is wow. amazing. I think more people need to know that. But you know, on the other hand, that means that there's like seventy five percent that have to live with it. You know, that don't recover from an episode that have to carry on. Uh, right. Yeah, living and sort of managing with it. And I think for yourself, if you don't mind me saying, and tell me if you don't believe this is true, but you are someone who it's had quite a severe effect on throughout yeah. your life so far. So what I'd really love to do now is just get into that, sort of sure. go back to the beginning of you. Sure. And, you know, if you can talk me through your childhood and your first sort of experiences of this, is it called a disorder? Is that the right way to describe it? Yeah, I mean, people label it as a disorder, but I hate that term. Okay. Because it's like, Educate sorry, I'm not, no, 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 no. not, not criticising you. I it's just mean learn. the, I mean, there's, this could be a whole other thing, but like the language around sort of diagnosis, like I hate, I hate it. What's hate a better it. way to say it then? Just not disorder. Okay. Because um, disorder Condition? sounds like, what's that? Condition? Condition, yeah, I guess so. I, I've, yeah, I've got a funny thing around um, labels. Well, um, but completely understandably, because yeah. presumably you've had them sort of given to you all through your life. Yeah, sure. And often with labels, especially with diagnosis, it's not ones that we're choosing to call ourselves. It's no. not like becoming something and saying, I'm this now. It's someone else is saying, you're this. So that's completely understandable. How uh, do you describe yourself? Like when you're talking about it, do you say my situation or condition or what do you, what do you use? Someone gave me some really good advice when I was in my mid twenties. Um, Cause you know, I went to like a lot of support groups and I would, I would talk about my diagnosis as me so like you know I'm schizophrenic or I'm mm -hmm. depressive and mm -hmm. and someone said to me why'd you do that because you know you'd never say like I'm cancer mm -hmm. or I'm cancerous you'd never say that you say I have 
I have cancer. I'm living with cancer. But when it comes to mental illness, we often say, yeah, I'm, I'm depressed or I'm, yeah, I'm schizophrenic. Um, do you know what I mean? And that, that shifted things for me because I was like, yeah, that, oh, hold on, I'm more than my mental illness. I have this thing, but I'm more, I'm more than it. Yeah, so let's go back to you and your childhood and when you first realised something was different. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, um, pretty early on, I'd say, I realised that I didn't, well, I, I realised I didn't fit in. But I'd say things got really, really difficult when I was like, I don't know. I can't remember the exact, like, age three, four. Oh, very young, though, still. Yeah, I was young, yeah. I started to experience what we call night terrors. Um, I didn't obviously know what that was back then. But basically, yeah, things would come to life for me, particularly at night. Like, I'd be in bed, and um, in the 80s, there was an animated version of the BFG, Roald Dahl's the BFG. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. I do. It scared, it scared the life out of me. And anyway, I watched it. And then I started to see what I thought was the BFG at night, like coming to my window. And there's that, there's that scene at the beginning of the film, the BFG, where he's, the BFG has got his hooded cloak oh, yes. on and he goes through the town to people's kids' windows. And I was like, yeah, I, I thought I heard him at my window. And like I saw figures, particularly around my bed. Um, anyway, basically, I stopped being able to sleep properly. Um, because you were having these vivid and waking up from these vivid dreams well no I was just lying I wouldn't go to sleep I was oh, basically see. lying I was scared I was. I remember feeling like really scared I wouldn't sleep and obviously my parents didn't understand what was going on basically I ended up I wouldn't sleep in my own bed I would only sleep in their bed um, and it started off one night and then it just every night every night I guess that, that must be hard as well because you know I'm listening to that I've got a um, daughter who's almost four she has night terrors she oh. tells me she's seen things she tells me she's seen things in the room but like as a parent all kids constantly say stuff like that yeah. so it must be very hard for your parents to differentiate you know to, to pick up on something like that at that age because I guess most kids are sort of saying you know my, my, my daughter will come back from school and from preschool and say to me oh they brought a lion in today which okay. is obviously not true you never know. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she'll tell me stories that are clearly untrue, but I suppose for your parents, it must have been quite hard at that point to go, oh, there's something else going on. Yeah, particularly, you know, this was this was the, eight, well, 18, 1989, 1990, mental health was like not, not talked about at all, particularly, again, coming from a Jewish, like, conservative mm -hmm. home, like, it was not talked about. So there were lots of behaviours that I was exhibiting that were, um, you know, like... <laughs> Yeah, I mm, like I'd interact with my toys, but um, I'd interact with other people with my toys, um, and they'd ha all have characters, and they would do things that um, I'm not proud of. Like, um, I like, uh, like um, my my one of my best friends, who I'm still actually uh, very good friends with today. I don't know how he forgave me, but basically. One day he, he got his room redone and I went over with my toys and they all had names, they all had characters and these toys started to like <laughs> pour bleach like all over his new room. It's really embarrassing and even pour bleach on him. Oh, um, and this was happening in real life? As yeah, it was in real life. But so you'd got the bleach and you were pouring it Well, out. yeah, but for me it was it was the toys. It wasn't me doing it. And for him, actually, bless him, he was like, oh, my God, stop your toys from <laughs> doing this. Right. Um, but, um, and there were, yeah, there were other behaviours as well. That, where, where do you got the bleach from at that age? Well, he had bleach under his sink in, in his oh, room. Wow. And it's, it's not great, is it? Um, but other things I would, um, I'd break a lot of stuff around the house, um, in, my, in my parents' house. Like, I don't know, I remember like, just randomly my mum got a new nice pair of like candlesticks like really nice ones and I just went and broke them um, with my toys though I'd always blame them on my toys you know all my toys had yeah these personalities they had relationships I did lots of like like when I look back like all the trees in my garden had names and characters and relationships and all the even like cars like on the way to school like they'd all have I don't know, I'd like role play 
sure. the cars talking to each other. And uh, but when so with the toys, when you remember that time, do you remember it as you making the toys doing it, or do you remember it as in the toys were doing it themselves, and you were just kind of present? No, I believe that these. This is the thing. I believe that everything was real, like the the night terrors with the BFG, the toys doing these things, the trees, <laughs> the trees in my garden, the the, the cars, the. Um, you know, all talking to each other. It was all in my head. It was real because as you say with your daughter, like, you know, at that age, you just think, you just take it for what it is, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. You don't question anything. You're just like, yeah, this is happening. You know, if this mug comes to life, then it comes to life and starts moving. And, you know, it just, you just take it for what it is. You don't question. So things, it, right? even though it was you physically moving the things in your head, it wasn't you. It was them doing it and you were kind of present. Yeah, I believed I was like an angel, like good as gold. Right. Obviously it wasn't. Um, and yeah, all these things that were like, it's weird. Like when I look back, like I had no, when I went over to my friend's house and I messed up his brand new room and poured bleach on him, I was like, um, and you know, my mum obviously got called to come and pick me up. And I was like, but it wasn't me. Mm. You know, it wasn't me. Um, it wasn't my fault. I didn't have any, I didn't have any regret. It makes me feel like, oof, like, talking about it makes me feel really uneasy but I didn't have any like I was like it's the toys so it's not me Mm. so was there a confusion about why you'd get in trouble for things like that yeah and I'd really lash out I'd really really lash out I'd be you know yeah I because I suppose to you it was like someone saying to me if my brother had done something it would be someone like someone saying you did that and me saying no my brother did it yeah, yeah and they yeah. just wouldn't believe me which must have felt incredibly sort of frustrating and confusing yeah 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 i did i did I, look i i lashed out more and more i became more and more destructive i would yeah I'd, I'd get i'd get punished but again i i didn't feel any regret or i, I just was angry at yeah at being punished because I think a lot of it, when I look back, actually is fear. I was scared. I was scared of, particularly like the things that would happen at night, mm. you know, with like the the big friendly giant, big friendly giant, the BFG. I was I was scared. I was really scared, and like the figures in my room and the noises, and um, I was scared, and I couldn't probably communicate that. Yeah, I mean, it must have been terrifying if you thought I'm going to go in my room and all these figures are going to appear and surround my bed and come in the window and stuff like that. It would would have been a horrible thing to know was going to happen every single night. Yeah. And so by this point, my mum and dad were taking me to the doctors. Right. So had they sort of realised that something was different to the other children? So was that a mental health specialist that you'd been going to see at that age? Well, initially I just, they took me to the doctor and then eventually the doctor was like, you know, after a few times, there's this letter that, I have in my records, which is quite, um, it's, it's from my doctor to my, what became my psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, mm. I think psychologist. Anyway, basically being like this family are really desperate now, you need to see this young boy. He's violent and destructive and he's not sleeping and he's doing this and he's doing that. So, um, so yeah, I think my parents, it was, that was a big thing for them because um, again, for a young a young, really young person to go and see a, you know, mental health specialist, quite taboo. Yeah. You know, well, I think even now. Decades ago. Yeah, but even now, I think for like kids, like we, I think we've got more of an understanding of mental health than adults, mm. but for kids, especially young kids, like there's still like a lot of fear, you know, oh my gosh, my my child at that age, might there might be something going on. Like a lot of fear, a lot of, so again, like, yeah, I did eventually see this psychologist, but again, even with that, there was a lot of like, you know, we don't really want to tell like extended family because mm. it's like, you know, our little boy is seeing this psychologist, this mental health specialist. That's Do you remember cool. feeling embarrassed about that at that age? <laughs> I didn't feel embarrassed. I remember feeling, um, I didn't, no, not embarrassed. But I remember feeling a bit confused. Like mm. I was going to this hospital, mm. big hospital called Norfolk Park in Harrow, big hospital. So I remember being like, you know, as a kid, like they'd take me there and you know, I had some understanding of like what hospitals Mm -hmm. were. So I was like, why am I going to this hospital? And why am I seeing this woman every week? And um, Oh, so it was quite frequent every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So had they decided once once you started, were they like, there is something going on? Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, look, again, I was really young, so I don't remember like all the like Mm -hmm. interactions with this. I remember she was an older lady and 
I was a little bit scared of her. Um, look, somehow we managed to kind of work through stuff um, in the, in those appointments in that time. Um, and I think the big thing for me was the night terrors and the sleep. So mm. eventually, again, it took some time, but eventually she managed to get me out of my parents' bed back into my own bed. I had to sleep with all the lights on, but, you know. That it was, seemed like progress. Yeah, that was mm. progress, actually. And not just for me, but for my parents, because it was, you know, it wasn't easy T for them. Tiring. <laughs> well, yeah, having me, like, in the, in the middle of their, their bed at home all, every night and, like, kicking them and... Yeah, it wasn't easy. So I think, yeah, that felt like progress for sure. And so we'd made a, you'd made a bit of progress there and you kind of got to the point where you could move back into your own bed and presumably at that point people thought, oh, this is working and things are getting better. Yeah. So how did it progress from there? Yeah, I always, I just, all, all the way through primary school, I felt different and a bit lonely and mm. a bit weird. Um, like, so I would spend... I would spend my lunch breaks like on my own in the library and I'd read the same books. So I was obsessed with um, uh, the Tudors, the Tudor period. I was obsessed with Queen Elizabeth I for some reason, I don't know why. So I, every lunchtime I'd go to the library and just read the same book. Um, but the thing was that that school and most schools really just care about the academic mm -hmm. grades and academically I was doing quite well actually. So everyone was like, yeah, Johnny's, you know, he's very quiet. He doesn't talk much, but he's doing really well in his exams and that's all we... That so is. it's going well. It's going well mm. because academic, yeah. And in the background while this was happening, do you think that the situation with your mental health was kind of just running at a kind of stable kind of level or do, were, you, were you feeling peaks and troughs? Like, were there points you'd feel like you had more imaginary things happening or was it just all pretty much much of a muchness? No, I'd say that my sort of like when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, I was quite, quite stable actually. And this is where, so religion actually played a big part as I started to, because basically, you know, it, I had to go to Sunday school um, and, you know, learn about God and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Bible. And, and that was, that really had a, I don't know, that really had a sort of impact on me. And then, so, you know, it was a, a, a good impact or a bad impact? No, not, really. not really. Well, I thought it was a good impact at the time, but looking back, I was scared. Like, again, I, I was scared. I was quite fearful of the things they were telling me about mm -hmm. God and, you know, um, sinning. And, mm -hmm. and and so, in terms of the gender thing, I remember I ended up, my secondary school was a Jewish secondary school. And so... <laughs> You know, then it was just constant in terms of, and and you know they 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 were against things like homosexuality, and they didn't shy away from that. And you know, particularly when I, you know, as you move into your secondary school teenagers, things do start to come up, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of like sexual um, stuff. And is that when you started to feel that way? Uh, that you started to feel that you might be attracted to? I I knew. Well, I knew. I I sensed something. I think I was like around, I feel like I was around 10. Right. When I remember, I've got this this recollection of basically sitting in a, in a restaurant. And I, I remember like there was this waiter, male waiter, and, and he was taking our order. And I was like, I feel something here. Like, I feel like some sort of like, there's an attraction here. And then I was like, oh my gosh, but I'm Jewish. And remember all those things that I was taught about, about homosexuality being a sin. Like, oh my gosh, this isn't happening bury this, bury this mm. down, like this, hor it was a horrible sense of like guilt and um, yeah, guilt and, and shame. And I was like, even as a sort of, yeah, I think I was 10, even as like a 10 year old, I was like, this, this has to like end now, like Johnny, like you just have to like stop this. Like, ha and I think that's quite sort of messy for, for a young person's mind, right? Definitely. You've gone through this process. You've kind of been going through the teenagehood where you're working things out yeah uh, you've got it sounds like you've got a lot going on because you've got this thing brewing in the background con um the 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 diagnosis well what would soon become a diagnosis you've got the sexuality which you might not be completely comfortable yet, with yet and you've also got the religious thing where i guess you probably felt a pressure towards your family to you know perform in a certain way and be a certain thing um 
I've heard you talk previously about something called the Truman delusion. Mm, yeah. Was that was it university that started that for you? <laughs> or slightly before? No, it was before. It was before. It was before. Do you mind explaining what that is? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> that's um yeah, I went to the cinema, I was ten. So the Truman show with Jim Carrey had just come out, it was big. I remember it was big, everyone was talking about it. And I went with my best friend and we saw it. <laughs> And that film had such an impact on me um, and, and, and my best friend. And when we came out of the cinema, my best friend said to me, wow, like you never know, but like you could be on your own version of the Truman Show. And um, then it was just like, oh my God, like, yeah, I could be. And, and this like, is quite difficult for me to say, but I kind of want to be. I I felt completely like, um, you know, when I, especially starting secondary school, as I said, I didn't fit in. I felt like a complete loner, complete outsider. And so the thought of me being on this TV show and like people watching me and people liking me, I was like, okay, okay, yeah, maybe. And then it's amazing how you can convince yourself, like, you know, things are happening that aren't happening. So it didn't help that my best friend would... Because he knew that it was there in my head and, and he would do things. I'm sure he didn't mean to like, you know, do these things. But he would do things like, um, you know, in the Truman Show, in the film, you know, they'll like yes. hold things up to the camera. like Sponsorship. Sort of, yeah, product placement. And um, like, oh, this cup of coffee is like, is the best coffee I've ever had. Mm. And like, um, my best friend would do that. You know, be like, oh, this... Um, and so part of me was like, is this, you know, is this, is this real? You know, is he, is, is, you know, what is this? So for him, he's doing it as a kind of joke to tease you a little. Bit, yeah. Sure. But not realizing that for you, you're sort of looking at that and going, oh my God, it's proof. Yeah. Oh God. Like every, every sign that I could like grab to make me believe that I was in this show, I would. So like, you know. It, like things like even things like which this is quite far fetched, but like you know you know sometimes I'd have a song playing in my head, and then I'd get in the car and on the way to school that song was the first song that came on to the radio, and so um, I'd be like oh my god they're in my head they they know they know that was the song and so they put that song on the radio and it's all everything revolves around me or you know and this happened <laughs> well sometimes happens today I, you know I'm. I'm thinking of someone in my head, someone, and they're there, mm -hmm. like on the street or in, in back in school, in the playground. They're there. That was the person I was thinking of. They're there. They're in my head. They're like, everything is like, because in the, in the Truman show, in the film, like the cameras are obviously all around and I'd be like, you know, looking around my room and I'd be like, well, that's, that's a camera. Like my light bulb in my, my ceiling light, that's a camera. And, uh, and I, I did, I liked it at first. I really liked it because I was like, People are going to see me. People are going to actually see me and, and, and yeah, like me. That was the big thing. I just wanted to be liked. And so, and on, and on the Truman Show, the film, everyone loved Jim Carrey's mm. character, right? Everyone loved him. And so I want that. I want that. And so, yeah, at first it was great. But then obviously, as I got older and needed more privacy, I was like, I don't want these cameras here anymore. Like, Well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because once you get to a certain age, if you're trying to do private things or whatever it is, <laughs> whatever is funny look from you there, whatever it might be, you wouldn't want members of the public or potentially your parents or, you know, in your head were your parents in on it? Yeah, everyone yeah. was in they, on everyone it. Everyone was in on it. So they were all watching you. Yeah, but that was okay because I know I keep saying this, but the, and it's still an issue for me, like this needs to be like universally, not just even liked, but loved, like, like Jim Carrey on The Truman Show. Mm -hmm. Like I needed this universal... Yeah, love, because ultimately I didn't have it for myself, so I needed everyone else's validation. And We're taking a quick break from the episode now to talk about one of the sponsors of this episode, Harry's. You might have heard of their products before. Our producer, Connor, actually already uses them. So, Connor, tell me about your experience with Harry's. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Harry's razor blades. Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I close shave or I wet shave, I tend to get a shaving rash if mm -hmm. I don't use the right products. But I find that Harry's eradicates that. It's a five blade razor. 
Um, it comes in a variety of co colours. I've got a nice bright orange colour myself. <laughs> Lovely. Mm. What are the other options of colour? I believe there's a, a green, like a forest green, and a blue, and also a black. That would be what I went for if I close shaved. Mm. Nice. And what other kind of products do Harry's do? So actually, I got a bit of a kit when I signed up to Harry's, and it came with um, the fire blade razor, the, the razor head, obviously, um, the foaming shave gel, which smells lovely, aloe vera, and uh, that's what I find helps me protect my skin. And also, what I find really handy is the uh, travel cover. So if you're putting your razor in a wash bag, it stops it getting other bits and pieces in there and protects the blades themselves. Fantastic. Well, it's a five-star review from you, Connor, I think. It is, yes. <laughs> if you like the sound of that, uh, Connor certainly seems happy with the product, then you can get started by heading to harrys.com slash minutes. You can get a free trial set. All you cover is free 95 for delivery, and you'll get it sent straight to your door. And listeners of the show will also get a free hydrating night lotion too. To pick that up, it's harrys.com slash minutes. But, the, but I suppose I want to get on to now about the, um, you know, what, what happened at university that really led to a big change in your life, your kind of, you know, the diagnosis and what happened after that? Yeah, I mean, um, university, uh, look, I had some, and again, I had some great times, like really had some great times. The great times were amazing, but the bad times were awful. At university, like everything was taken to a more extreme level. Mm -hmm. So like um, the depression, like, just felt like even maybe because I didn't have the comfort of home and my family to again run to escape from everything felt more extreme and so I started to I don't know do things like self-harm and misuse alcohol and um that was yeah that obviously that was a real both of those things were because it, it wasn't just a one-off thing I didn't just self-harm once it was you know yeah, same with the alcohol, like, you know, it becomes a thing, right? And I, and what annoys me, actually, is that I was going to my student doctor. I didn't want to tell anyone else. But I was going to my student doctor, and it just wasn't taken seriously. Mm. As, as I hear all the time from young people, you know, their mental health is not taken seriously. It's like, oh, you're stressed. You've got university work. No, there might be something else underlying going on. You know, so I just felt really um, on my own with it. Again, like at university, no one ever talked about mental health. I know it's different now, but no one, like people talk a lot about like safety in your halls of residence or your student house or, 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 or um, security, like but no one talked about mental health. So I, I literally felt I was the only person that was going through some sort of thing because everyone else just seemed happy all the time. Everyone else just seemed like they were just living their best lives. So do you think to other people looking at you, they'd have thought that about you too? Or do you think they would have said, oh, he doesn't seem like a very happy person? No, initially people were like, yeah, Johnny's great. But then um, people started to, I, particularly with self-harm, the self-harm that I was doing, people started to notice. Oh, it was obvious, was it? Yeah, it was yeah. obvious. Come my like second year and then into my third year, it was like, and the drinking, like it was like, and the amount of times people would be like, Johnny, what's going on? But I was so good at like putting people off the scent. I was so good at like... Oh, so they would actually address you and ask well, about it? Yeah, but they wouldn't... And I'm not I'm not criticising them because mm -hmm. we didn't get taught about how to talk about mental health, but they would ask me once and then they'd be like, okay, so you're stressed, fine, I'll, I'll leave it. And I'm not, again, it, it's just the way that it was. Um, but yeah, I was able to throw people off the scent, they were able to like divert. Mm. So yeah. Um, but I, in, I can't remember what year it was now, first, second year, I started to take antidepressants. Um, but it didn't seem to really work. My head was just, felt like it was just getting more and more scrambled. Um, more and more, um, again, especially with things like the drinking. Um, and then I think, I think for me that it was going into my third year that, that tipped me over the edge um, because that's when I started to really um, think about my sexuality. Mm. You know, if, this was university and like, you know, students were getting up to all sorts. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, why not me? So, um, yeah, in the first time of my third year, I, I, one night I, I got with a guy um, that I met online and uh, 
that <laughs> that that experience um, sent me into a psychotic episode, um, essentially, because uh, I. Well, all the all the feelings in terms of the religion came back, like the guilt and the shame. I was like, I remember leaving the morning after, and I was like, oh my god, like what have I done? What have I done? Like what have I done? What am I doing? Were you still a religious person at this point? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did, did the feeling of sinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. I quite. I was questioning my relationship with like my faith and. But it was still there, the like, you know, the feeling of having to do everything right and, and not sinning was still there. And so me oh, me being with this guy was like the the was like the worst for me in my head in terms of, you know my faith. What I, yeah, it was it was I just felt disgust, like absolutely disgust in myself for what I'd done. And that yeah, sent me sent me over the edge yeah and how did that manifest when you said you had a psychotic episode it was actually f three weeks before that i'd say i had my i guess proper proper first psychotic episode sorry yeah i got my i've got my timelines that's all right yeah, that's fine but basically basically this was november 2007 um i i had a car accident Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, but it was only a minor one. It was only a minor car accident. Um, but basically someone reversed into me. And um, so it, it it triggered something in me. Um, it, it, it triggered this uh, this feeling of being completely out of control. Like, com like, I've never... Obviously, I'd had, like, you know, real serious depression and stuff, but never this feeling of being completely, like out of control not knowing what I'm going to do next like I felt and uh, <laughs> I started to drink I don't know I don't know what else to do I started to drink and then um, ooh, I just got this impulse like I needed to get out of my house and uh, I go onto a dual carriageway go into the middle of this dual carriageway and then I started to um, to shout and scream these things. I felt like I was being possessed. I felt like I was, yeah, being possessed. And um, I couldn't control the stuff that was coming out of my mouth. Um, didn't, it wasn't me. It was like, yeah, I was being properly, properly possessed. And um, obviously, obviously people were like stopping their cars. I was in the middle of this dual carriageway. But, you know, I think t to them, they thought, probably thought I was on drugs or, mm. you know, shouldn't be approached. I was really, yeah, I was, I was, I was not with it. I was, yeah. But eventually I, um, I kind of just collapsed and I knew at that point, like I, I was out of control. I needed help. And so I actually, <laughs> I phoned uh, my housemate and I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I need to go to hospital. Um, and so, yeah, she, well, two of them actually came and picked me up, took me to A&E. But that was a whole, like, uh, it was just didn't, it didn't work very well. It didn't, didn't go very well. Um, basically, they were like, can't really help you. Um, we can send someone out to see you at some point, but I was like, I need help. I, remember, I really, like, I was at the point now where I was like, okay, I don't care. I need. I know. I need help. I need help. I need you to help me. And they're like, "Yeah, we can. We can send someone out." And I was like, "No, I need help now." That's quite shocking to me to yeah, hear because well. obviously it's not a situation I've been. It's not a situation I've been involved in. But the thought that someone could be screaming on a dual carriageway, a young person, uh, and collapse and go to any, and they say, "Oh well, there's not much we can do. You should go home." Like, is there not facilities for emergency? Mental health. It still goes on today. It's, it's the amount of stories there of, you know, yeah, young people going to A&E. Not just young people, people going to A&E in a really bad way. And they're just told, it, you know, can't do anything for you now, you know, maybe in a few days or next week or six months. But, it, yeah, again, there's a lot that needs to change. Okay. So then you sort of return to your life, I guess, 
were told there wasn't much could happen, and then you met this guy online, and that and that did you say that was a week later or two weeks? No, later? it was three weeks later. Three weeks later, yeah. and that triggered a yeah. secondary. And how did how did the secondary psychotic episode oh manifest? Well, I'd say that was more of a that wasn't a full blown like not like the first one. That was more of a kind of like <laughs> I um yeah I I I had the thing with the guy the night before. And then the next morning I was like, and so I just, I, I got in my car, I just got in my car and I sped down, <laughs> I sped down the, um, the M6 and the M1 back to my, and I was, I felt completely out of control. I was crying the whole, I don't know how I did it. Like, um, I don't know how I did it. Looking back, I just, I don't know. I just, I was like, I need to, I need to get back to my parents. And so. And then when I got back to my parents, I just went straight to my bedroom and um, I was like, everyone needs to leave me alone. Everyone needs to leave me alone. And um, my parents obviously knew straight away that was like, what, what is, what's, what's going on? He's not, he's not right. Eventually they managed to convince me like, you need to see someone ASAP. And so I did, saw a doctor. Um, look, they, they, paid, they paid for a private doctor because they were that, oh, really worried never seen me like this and I just yeah I just I wrote down and I confessed everything confessed I, I just said everything that had happened was going on in my head and she was like you need to go to hospital now and that was it and then I ended up in psychiatric hospital with sitting in front of this psychiatrist pouring everything out and then he was like you've got schizoaffective disorder yeah, and that was that was that. When you heard that, it's, it's quite a big thing to hear, isn't it? The implications for the rest of your life and and the stuff like the Truman delusion, realizing in that moment none of it had been true, it must have been a hard thing to hear. Yeah, it was it was <laughs> it was horrendous, but it was kind of like kind of like the final nail in the coffin for me to be like that's sorry that's a bit it's not a very good term to sure. use but for me to be like I'm done this is this is because there was not just this there was my sexuality as well you know that obviously I was like this is oh god this is it this is it I, it felt like yeah sort of kind of death sentence and I just then spent the next month on this um, suicide ward, just sort of, I don't even know. I, I, don't, I don't know, like just, just, I think just getting to the point of being like, I'm gonna do it now, I'm gonna take my life. I just, yeah, getting to that moment of being like, oh, I just, I can't, I, 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 I literally cannot do another second and this is it, I'm done. So it was, that month was just, I mean, it was, it was hell. It was hell. But that was what, yeah, took me to that place of done. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. And you got to a position where you did actually make that attempt, didn't you? Which is, came, do you want to talk about how you got to the bridge? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I I made the decision. Um, I was going to run away, go to this bridge, and so um, and once I'd made that decision, I was like, right, done, done, final decision, no turning back. Um, and so yeah, um, basically that was that was that was the night of the thirtieth of January, two thousand eight. It's the morning of the fourteenth of January, two thousand eight. Woke up, had the plan in my head, and did the usual. You know, I have to take my medication. I have to see my psychiatrist, and I was like, and I was bullshitting. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm getting better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I ran away. I legged it. Seems surprising to me that um, you were on a suicide ward and you were able to just exit the building. Yeah, well, they <laughs> they let me out for a cigarette because I said I need. I didn't smoke back then, actually, <laughs> but um, I was able to. 
But I'd seen other people do it, you know, let you outside have a cigarette. But for me, I was like, as soon as their back's turned, and I'm quite a good, quite a fast runner. So I was like, as soon as their back was turned, run, 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 run. And I ran, I ran, I was like, Forrest Gump. Like I ran, I ran, yeah, I ran to the nearest station and, you know, I had it all planned. I ran to the nearest station and got the train. And um, yeah, got to the, the bridge and um, walked up uh, to the middle of it and yeah, uh, took myself over it onto the onto the ledge. Yeah, and then I was there. And then what happened? And then, um, I mean, I wasn't on the edge for very long. I mean, look, it, I don't remember the, you know, I was pretty, <laughs> I don't remember like the time, the seconds, the minutes, but I wasn't on that edge for very long when this stranger, this young guy came up and just stood next to me and just started to try and talk to me. Um, and um, uh, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to engage with him at first. I just wanted him to leave me alone. I told him that, but there was just something about him that was different. Like he, he wasn't going to leave me alone. He was going to stand there and and try and help me. And I don't know. Eventually, I I realised he wasn't going anywhere. And I guess yeah, I started to to you know engage with him. And uh, it was really hard. It wasn't easy, but yeah, started to engage with him. And yeah, it was tough for him. And for me, but for him, like, you know, I wasn't really, you know, my answers were just one word and I didn't, I didn't want to open up, but there was, there was just something about him and the way that he listened that made me eventually like start to, you know, talk a bit. And I hadn't, that's the thing, like I wasn't, I wasn't speaking in the hospital. I found it too difficult. Um, and to be honest, like, the whole suicide thing, like, you know, I, I was, I was trying to, I was trying to say when I felt suicidal in the hospital and they'd be like, right, well, yeah, we will give you these, this medication now. You told us that we'll give you this medication now, sleep it off or, or mm. calm yourself down. And whereas with this guy, it wasn't like that. It was just like, okay, tell me, talk to me. And I was like, well, <laughs> like you want to hear about, you know, what? So yeah. I so guess. was it was it the fact that he was genuinely seemed like he was willing to listen? Is that what made a difference? To yeah, you? for sure, hundred percent. Willing to listen, but also willing to and able to support and 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 give me some positivity. That hospital was so bleak, and the things that I was being told and the things that my family were being told was just so bleak, you know. My psychiatrist was saying, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to you. You are really unwell. And obviously, you know, you just want to be told, you know, it's okay. It's okay. You can get through this. And finally, this guy was like, offering that to me. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something, another way. Look, it took a long time for me to, yeah, Finally, like he was obviously trying to get me away from the edge and get me off, and it, it took it took time, but he stayed and he yeah he had so much patience and empathy and encouragement and yeah managed to eventually get me off and away and onto the pavement. And then did you after that did you return to the hospital? Yeah, yeah, I. We, we were meant to go for a coffee, but um, obviously someone had called the police, of course. Right. You know, it's yeah. obvious what was going on. So someone had called the police and the police quickly, quickly charged in as soon as I got off the edge. And, you know, um, it got messy because I was, it just, yeah, got a bit messy. I was, I was scared, I guess. But had his, had that conversation stayed with you in the sense that you weren't thinking as soon as this is all over, I'm going to try again. It had given you a new direction in a way. Yeah, for that day. For sure. And actually, yeah, no, it did. It shifted something slightly. It did shift something. It, it did. It was, I mean, it's still really hard, like, you know, 
going back to the hospital. I was sectioned with the police. I was, I was sectioned. I was taken back to the hospital. There was a lot of like, my psychiatrist was like, why? What? Like my parents and everyone was like, why didn't you say anything? And I was like, I couldn't. Um, so there was a lot that I, you know, there was, there was so much that I had to like work through. So it, it took, I mean, it took a long time, but yeah, that conversation, it did, it, it did, it did change something in me for sure. Gave me, gave me a little bit of hope, I think, for sure, 100%. Okay, we're going to take a minute here, guys, to talk about one of the sponsors of this episode, which is NordVPN. Connor, one of the producers of the show, already uses NordVPN, so it seemed to make sense to bring him in and tell us about it. How do you find it, Connor? Really, really useful. Yeah. So for me, I use it mostly when I'm abroad and I'm in the middle of a show that I'm streaming on any sort of platform based in the UK. But obviously you have that age old problem when you're on holiday with your family, you want to watch the latest episode, but you can't because Mm -hmm. of where your country is located that Mm -hmm. you're on holiday in. Uh, NordVPN allows you to change your location virtually. Got you. So you can catch up whilst you're abroad and it stops any spoilers from any of your friends on those groups before you get home. Um, it's great for things like booking hotels as well and booking flights whilst you're in another country, for example. It's great when you're traveling. I highly recommend it. Well, Connor is certainly a fan of NordVPN. And if you'd like to try it for yourself, Extraordinary Lives listeners can get an exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash minutes. You'll get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and four additional months for free. And it's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash minutes minutes and i guess like you say there was a lot of work to do after that and yeah. it probably felt a little bit like did it well i don't know i don't want to put words in your mouth did it feel like your life slightly went on pause you know you'd been in university and i guess now everything else was ultimately paused until you went through this process so where how long did that take <laughs> well i mean it took it took years to be honest i mean it's look it's still <laughs> i'd say it's still ongoing um uh, yeah, it's still ongoing because I have relapses, and so yeah, it still still goes on. But I'm I, I think I'm in a different place, um, a, a better place than I was back then. And, and you know, definitely for me, all those years of because there was so much to figure out, like in terms of medication, having to find the right sort of medication medications, like the the, the right doses and stuff, having the right therapy and having it actually like, you know, having an impact, it all, it all took years. And, um, I said, it still, still goes on. Um, but obviously I, I think for me, yeah, I look, there was a lot of, there was a lot of denial at the beginning, a lot of, I don't want to deal with this. I mean, my family and my friends, it was none of us were able to really talk properly. It was really hard for everyone. Um, in those first few years, um, not just with my mental health, but my sexuality. So those first few years, yeah, there was, there was so much to, to work through. And so, it, yeah, I'd say, I'd say like all of my early twenties were just a bit of a write off. To be honest, I didn't work. I didn't, I didn't function properly. Um, I didn't deal with it properly. And it was hard cause I saw like all my, all my friends, you know, getting jobs and having relationships and I just felt stuck. So yeah, it was definitely not until my mid twenties when I was like, I feel a bit more human again now, finally. Um, And you say now that you still have relapses, you know, is that, does that still include the, you know, voices or imaginary things, or is that something that's more under control now? I mean, when I have relapse, when I have a relapse, I usually have a yeah psychotic episode, and for me, that usually <laughs> usually manifests in um, more the Truman thing, the Truman delusion comes back. Obviously, I don't just like suddenly switch into a psychotic episode. There's a build up, but when I do switch into a psychotic episode, it's yeah, it scares me. Like how I can like with the Truman delusion, it it takes over me. So like, I remember one psychotic episode that I had um, a few years ago and I, so actually I was with um, Neil, the guy from the bridge because we reunited and which was amazing. 
really amazing. As part of a documentary, is that part correct? Of, yeah, yeah, part of a documentary, The Strangers on the Bridge, reunited, and um, yeah, it was, ama- it was amazing. But then, you know, I, I wasn't looking after myself, um, and I was becoming unwell, and anyway, one, one afternoon when we were in, in Covent Garden in London, which is obviously quite busy, I just... Something happened. We were really late for a meeting and I I lost it. I lost it in this, well, in this building and I, I went to the floor and I screamed and I ran out into Covent Garden and then I was like, like everyone's, everyone's, a, everyone's an actor, everyone's, and even to, to Neil, which was really hard because, you know, obviously, yeah, that was really hard because, um, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what someone is saying to you, you really believe, or I really believe, like, everyone's an actor and this is all a film set. And, and what makes it, you know, what made that episode really hard was obviously people stop and stare, don't they? And that makes me even more like, I remember someone got the fucking camera out of the phone and fucking started filming me. And I was like, yeah, I'm on the Truman Show, you're filming me. Um... But it's horrible. You know, the people that you love, like the people that I love, like, you know, I obviously love Neil and my family and my friends. And I'm like, you're all actors and this is all a film set. And, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm like, obviously I, now I'm in a place where I, you know, <laughs> although I don't want to think about it too hard, but, you know, I think this is all legit. And I think this is all a non Truman Show experience, but when I'm in that psychotic moment, it doesn't matter. Like, literally, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm in that headspace of like, this is this is this is this is um, encompassing me, and this is what's really happening. And you're all like fake, and you're all lying, and yes, yeah, and it's horrible because you can't. I can't get out of that headspace. Like, I remember I was like. That episode, I was having to like, I had to close my ears and I had to say things and I had to pace in certain directions. And eventually, uh, you know, I got to the hospital. I was slated. Do you know at that point you're having a psychotic episode despite the fact you're doing it? Or is it just everything goes into the psychotic episode? Every, every, no, no, because okay. I'm right, because I'm right. Like, because yeah. I honestly truly believe everything is fake everything is every, this is all a film set this is all everyone is an actor this is all these are all cameras the whole of me believes that it doesn't matter again what anyone says I believe that I'm in that fully and I don't trust anyone and um, it's, oh, it's a it's, it's a horrible feeling because you know I'm I mean yeah it's it's unfathomable to me basically and it sounds it sounds unbelievably difficult but what I want to speak about a little bit now is what you do now because you are an inspirational person in the fact that you were dealt quite a tough hand but you've got yourself to a position where you are helping others and I'd like to hear a little bit about that yeah I mean look I try I think um I think it's difficult because Do you want a minute? No, it's fine, honestly. Because it happens, you know, it, uh, it happens a lot in terms of relapsing. And every time I have a relapse, you know, I say that I'm never gonna have another one because I can't go through it again. But yeah, it's hard. It's just hard because um, I do end up having, and you know, I, I so I had my last relapse um, after I did the filming. I was, I'm not blaming you. <laughs> after I did the filming, obviously here in lockdown. I had a relapse just a couple of months later. 
And that oh, that was horrible because it was, you know, locked down and I was back in hospital and it was all locked down the wards. It was horrible. And I was like, this is my last relapse. This has to be my last relapse. It's just, it's, it's, it's sort of, a, it's a really difficult existence because you think that you just don't know when another relapse is going to come. And, you know, the work that I do is, is great, but, you know, obviously working in mental health, it feels like the only thing I can do because I know it so well. But I wish it, I wish it stopped me from falling back into relapses. And the truth is, like, you know, I don't look after myself as maybe I, maybe I should and I could. Um, I guess I'm I'm lucky because you know I, I I, you know I have a lot of support, and especially working with a mental health, I have a lot of support. You know, I have a lot of support. But when it comes to the actual, I think because it's. Any relapse is difficult, but because it's the psychotic element mm. and that feeling of that feeling of being out of control is just no one wants to be out of control, right? No, I think we're all very conscious of the fact that it must be very difficult. Um, no, no, but I have to talk about it. I have to talk about it because I spent such a long time not talking about it. It made me so ill, and yeah, I still get ill, but not. I don't because I talk about it now. It's, it's different. The illness. It's different. It's a tiny. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tiny bit easier because I talk and I'm honest. And so I just want other people. I meet so many people um, and so many families that have been affected by, like, particularly schizophrenia, schizoaffective. And unfortunately, a lot of time, the outcomes aren't the same as me um, mm. because it's such a hard illness and there's such a lack of understanding and support out there. You know, everyone that I've met with like schizophrenia is the most creative, intelligent, amazing people, but they're rejected by society. You know, this is the, the, the statistic that gets me a lot is that only 8% of people with schizophrenia are in work in the UK, which is, but when you talk to people, a lot of people with schizophrenia, not everyone, but a lot want to be in work. They want to be, mm. they want to have a purpose, but you meet so many people given these this diagnosis and you meet their families and they're just like rejected. And I felt that way, like through my early twenties, I was like, I'm not a part of society anymore. I'm, you know, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a reject now. And I realized that I'm, through all the work that I've done, and I've done quite a lot of work on myself, um, I realised that I do have a purpose and that there is a role for me in society and I just want other people who have schizophrenia and psychosis to realise that they are also worthy and valuable and um, they have a really major part to play in this society. Look at all the people, like um, all the artists and the crazy people, the singers, the musicians that had, had, had schizophrenia, have schizophrenia, so talented and they just don't get the help and support and the recognition and, 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 and the encouragement that they deserve. So I just want to change things for them. All right. Um, Johnny, I mean, it's been incredible sitting down with you again. I suppose the last thing that I want to ask you is if there's anyone listening to this or watching this now who feel some kind of similarity to what you're describing and might quite not understand it what would you want to say to them i think firstly don't be embarrassed like don't be embarrassed i know that's easy for me to say because i've you know sort of overcome that embarrassment but there's nothing to be embarrassed or or, or ashamed about you know it's i've learned it's the brain it's the it's just it's the brain you know it's not it's, it's, it's no different to like, uh, you know, another organ in the body. Like, you know, I know lots of friends, family that have, you know, other health issues, right? Um, maybe like like Crohn's disease, for example. And, you know, they they talk about it, they're open about it. They they And, and so should we, if we have, you know, things going on with our, with our brains, that there really is nothing to be yeah, embarrassed about. Like there's so much out there now in terms of support. Maybe that's, um, yeah, maybe that's a, a, a doctor, maybe that's a, a clinician, maybe it's... But actually groups, like for me, 
going to groups, uh, do you know what? I'll never forget the first time I went to a group. And it was a group for people that experienced schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and went into this room and sat down and just everyday people. And they started opening their mouths and things were coming out of their mouths. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I have these things in my head. Like, I can't believe this. I'm not alone. Like, the, the best feeling in the world is when you feel like you are human again, when you feel like you are, you know, you're not alone, when you feel like there's other people going through the same things as you, it's the best feeling in the world. And so there are so many other people out there going through what you're going through. And so, you know, please like have a look and see what's out there, you know, around you, near you. I just, be I believe there's always something out there for everyone. So, you know, please don't give up. It's a lovely message and um, you're a lovely person and it's a pleasure to meet you again and you remain an inspiration to me and I can see the crew nodding as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story and wish you all the best and thank I hope you. we do stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. You know, depend what you were scavenging for, you know, and, um, and so, yeah, that was a bit unnerving because, again, you know, there's always the rabies threat and stuff like that. They left that bit out of James Bond, didn't they? The, rat, <laughs> the rats in the rubbish dump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have been doing it in my tuxedo, that's for sure. 